The following broadcast is intended for mature audiences. These are real people sharing very real, deeply personal experiences. This content may be considered triggering for others and for those who are sharing. The chat room is a privilege intended for discussions and sharing. You are not being asked to agree, but you are being asked to stay civil and refrain from personal attacks. Listener discretion is advised. All right, thank you for tuning in to Am I Mental, a mental health live podcast where real people share real experiences living with mental health and mental issues. I'm your host, E, and with us tonight, as always, we have our co-host, KZ. Hey, everyone. Yeah, he's going to sound a little bit funny because he's on the road right now, but we're able to do this anyway. Thank God for technology. And today's guest, we have AJ. Go ahead and say hi, AJ. Hey guys! All right, so far I don't see anybody in chat yet, but they usually do show up. So um, before we do get started, I do want to once more give a shout out to someone that has really been helping to promote us um, down in the San Diego area, and that is Rachel Conway. Um, if you are looking for a therapist and you are in the San Diego area, specifically Mission Valley and Encinitas. Check her out. She has her business is Genuine Psychological Services. Honest to God, if it wasn't for the personal relationship I have with her and the geographic barrier, she would be my therapist. But I know her. I've known her for years. And of course, you know, there's a geographic thing. Now that that's out of the way, AJ, tell us a little bit about yourself and what are we going to be talking about tonight? Um, okay. I don't even wow, where to start? Um, I, know, I guess we, we spoke briefly the other day, um, yes, we did. Kind of just talking about a little bit of like my history, I guess my story. Um, it's kind of weird. It's still weird new for me to talk about like some aspects of it, of like my struggle with mental health issue and that, um, I was 15 when I was diagnosed with anxiety and depression, um, course I had struggled with it before that um but one of the biggest things I guess that I had a hard time kind of coming to grips with was l- much later probably well, close to actually almost 15 years later so literally almost half my life later realizing that I had um PTSD and as when we had spoke the other day I kind of mentioned too that it's still kind of hard for me to talk about it and to like admit it because my story is a lot different than what most people's would be um, that have that. So and it almost doesn't feel fair for, to me, like, I guess, to have that diagnosis when I didn't see combat. I wasn't in any kind of, like, physically abusive um, relationship or anything like that. But what it stems from mm-hmm. is um, growing up, I was, I guess, as a kid that already was, like, prone to the anxiety disorder and have a family history of that with a depression as well. Um, I grew up in a very conservative, um, almost kind of like a cult, like oppression with a lot of the things that um, I saw and with the uh, church that my family attended when I was a kid. Um, And it really just instilled a fear in me that it took almost two decades for me to even be able to um, talk about or to admit to myself. Um, But just having that like constant worry, that constant fear, that constant dread that whatever you did or said or whatnot wouldn't be good enough that there was, I think I used the phrase the other day, what was a sky tyrant? (laughs) Right. You said there was a sky tyrant who basically could smite you Yes. As in, kill you and destroy you at any moment, even off of having a bad thought. Yeah, and some of that stuff, and even like, okay, so just within the past like two years, I've been able to actually talk to my mom about this. And as I hadn't before, because I guess being older and being an adult and all that, and kind of realizing like, so I guess disclaimer, I'll kind of back up a little bit. Like my family is no longer involved in that at all either. So it's like, it's been a growth as like an entire family. Um 
so I kind of was finally at a point to be able to like talk to mom and say like, Hey, you know, this is what happened. This is how I felt kind of thing. Um, but yeah, so it was just this weird kind of, I was, I guess I was just a fearful kid too. And I mean, kids, like I'd mentioned that yesterday or the other day too, you know, by nature, kids let their imaginations run wild. Right. That's why you have to, you know, there's a monster under the bed, monster in the closet, like that kind of thing. Um, so by nature already, typically when a kid fills in the blanks, it becomes something scarier and worse. Um, so for me already with, I don't know how long I went with an undiagnosed, um, like anxiety, depression, kind of that thing. I know I dealt with it for years, especially the anxiety part of it. I mean, I remember probably being like eight, nine, ten years old and you know, dealing with it, not knowing what it was, not knowing what to call it at the time, but feeling it. Um, so it kind of, I guess, just went from there to being like this constant consuming fear. And aside from like, I guess, additionally for the whole you know, feeling like you could be like something going to smite you from the sky. It was also really kind of bizarre, like in my, my kid head, I guess. And it would be like, if I screw up, something bad's going to happen to somebody that I love because that's going to be the punishment to me. Right. So it could be like, you did something wrong. So your grandfather has a stroke. Exactly. And so it was this constant fear. I mean, can you like, Looking back to, like, I guess as my adult brain looking back at it, thinking, you know, that's crazy. But at the same time, I mean, I, I don't use the word crazy as in, like, stigma, you know, but, like, it's just kind of a bizarre thought to have. Like, Right. But it's again, not a rational, healthy, normal thought. Exactly, exactly. But being, you know, I guess somebody already with the, having the anxiety, the depression, that kind of thing, too. And it just kind of added to it. So... Um, just, I guess a couple examples to kind of let people like kind of get the, a feel for the kind of like stuff. And again, you know, the family's not like this anymore, which is great. (laughs) Um, I mean, and that probably helps out because now you can actually, you have someone to talk to about the past exactly, and they're not trying to draw you into it again. Right. Right. And the thing is too, is like I, when I was able to talk to my mom about it, actually the most recent time that I talked to my mom about it was probably just about month and a half ago maybe um because every now and then like things will just come up and i'll just be like hey you know you got a minute and um and she was saying like honestly like she didn't realize that kind of fear that was being instilled in me because to her as an adult she was looking at things with her adult mind basically right um and also her being older and you know i get not as like trusting and believing of just like everybody Um, So like me as a kid, you know, somebody says something and I think, well, they have this position or this title. So obviously they're right. Like, you know, I'm going to believe that's, you know, it is the gospel truth pun, maybe not intended, but you know, whatever. Right. But it's Um, it's also just, you know, for people that may not have had much in the way of a religious upbringing. Now, I didn't have a strong religious upbringing, but my dad was pretty active in the Catholic Church. And even I got pretty active with it, too. Uh, The whole thing of having a hierarchy of authority is very much something that that you respect. Even if you are rebelling against it, you still respect it. Right, yeah. And that's the thing, too. So, I mean, and and I know that there were times probably that I overheard things and, like, filled things in that kind of then became, like, this fear to me that shouldn't have been. But, I mean, again being a little kid, you know, what do you do? Um, but I kind of mentioned it to you the other day, like examples of things that like weren't, were, or were not allowed. Um, one of the things that kind of stands out as the most absurd was what I mentioned then that we didn't shop at Kmart because the company that owned Kmart also owned a bookstore that sold Playboy and Playboy was bad. So it's like this weird Illuminati confirmed kind of memes, like some of it. And it's just bizarre, like in retrospect, I'm like, of all things, like, I mean... <laughs> well, as you said, it, you, what you were in was Westboro without the protests and the signs. Yeah, I mean, they weren't quite, like, as vocal with, like, the... N- that nobody would ever actually come straight out and say, like, God hates this or God hates that. But that was kind of, like, the feeling of, like... Like, yeah, on the surface, like, we'll say, you know, oh, yeah, everyone's welcome, whatever. But, yeah, you kind of know who was and who wasn't, like... They probably wouldn't directly, like, throw somebody out in the middle of a service, 
but somebody may like if someone came in there and they were dressed wrong like afterwards someone's probably gonna pull them aside and be like listen don't come back unless you're gonna do this this and this first like so damn nonconformist yeah, yeah. <laughs> guilty um but yeah so and you know even in it's kind of a weird thing because like still I even have this dichotomy because and I guess as being an adult and looking at it now as an adult I still realize that there were the majority of the people that I came into contact with at that time honestly were people that were really did think they were doing the right thing like 100% you know they were to them like this is basically how they're going to save the world kind of situation. Right. Um, they weren't doing anything out of ma- like malicious intent or malice or because they wanted to hurt anybody. It was like the opposite, but going about it, you know, in a way that could very, very easily have a completely opposite effect to make people just run far, far away. Right. You know, that whole, sometimes uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> and we do have Klitsana on and Maya again. And I was like, Jesus was a nonconformist. Well, yeah, he he really was. Yeah, I mean that, that's hundred percent true. Like, and that's the thing. Like, I don't know. I remember like becoming a teenager and still being like involved in that um, specific church. Which kind of like as a weird disclaimer, that specific like church building um, still is in the same place. There's still a lot of the same people attend there. But the last I knew of it, it had completely different leadership and was like a night and day difference. So they so, like, maybe now they're actually following the spirit, not the letter. I mean, I think, yeah, I kind of think like, it's like, I, that's probably like how you would describe it. Yeah. Like it got rid of like the, the legalism kind of part of it, I guess. Like when people that like I knew that still go there um, and said that like, it wasn't like it didn't care if like you showed up wearing jeans or whatever. Like it didn't. It became like it, it basically. It was just like so I guess the it went from so it kind of went from everybody's welcome asterisk to let's erase the asterisk. Yes, yeah, which is great. I mean, you know, fantastic. Um, yeah, so that's like I guess it's kind of a disclaimer. Like going into this, that's something I was kind of worried about. Like I don't want this to come across as like I think these people were like horrible, terrible people, because for the majority, like they weren't. I mean, yeah, there's there's some some douchebags like in every group of people, and there's some jerks that do have malicious intent when you get a group of people together. Um, but like well, for like- the most part, it was just other people being misguided into thinking they're doing the right thing, but doing it the wrong way. Right. And I've always had the stance. I mean, this, this took me a while. I can't say I've always had the stance. This took me a while to actually formulate on my own. Um, and it's happened since, you know, a mutual friend of ours, who's rather famous, put it yes. out there and I started thinking about it. And it came to this conclusion that I cannot be angry at people who are ignorant because they've never been exposed to anything else. But right. I can be angry at those who are deliberately staying ignorant because right. they are getting exposed to other things and they're just rejecting it outright as, because their dogma makes them. Exactly. Yes, exactly. And that's like the first time I was ever able to like talk to my mom about this. I've really not talked to my dad about it a whole lot. Not because I wouldn't. It's just because right now his work schedule is crazy and it has been for the past like two and a half years. Um, so it's just kind of like getting the right time to like segue into it instead of just being like, Hey, I know you just finished a bowl of cereal. Let's, let's have this deep part to heart conversation kind of thing. Um, I want it to come up at some time. I'm just waiting for the right time. Right. But um, like I had told my mom too, like I don't hold it against them. Um, because what good would it do me? Basically? Like I have a good relationship with my parents. I have a good relationship with my family. Um, being able to talk to my mom about it and to un- like to explain to her like how I felt and the fear, like I was sincerely afraid that my grandparents were gonna go straight to hell because they bought some like toilet paper at Kmart. And that that is not a rational thought, but based on what you were, not. but based on what you were raised with, 
right, that was a exactly. rational thought. Yeah, and even my grandparents were like, "That's ridiculous." And I was like, "These are my grandparents. Like, they go to a, they attend a church as well, but oh my gosh, are they all going to hell because of this?" Like, and so it was just this weird. Like, I the term would be legalism. Um, it probably almost, like all these extra things. Right, and what I said last time because I mean it's almost the same fallacy as the God of the gaps. Where yeah. there's a gap that you don't understand, you throw God in there instead. Yeah. So, yeah, it's exactly. And also so, your whole thing about, you know, because I did X, Y happened, that's almost along right. the lines of the post hoc ergo proctor hoc yeah. fallacy, which is because I did this, then this happened because of it, even yeah. though there's no actual connection. Right. There is no, like, actual correlation. It just And, and, and it was a thing, like, especially... Becoming a teenager and, like, in that development between, like, kid and adult and all the things. And, I mean, teenage years are rough enough when you're not worried about, like, am I going to think something or say something or laugh at the wrong thing? And, you know, my best friend's going to die in a car accident because of it. And that was the kind of, like, worry and fear that I dealt with. Um, and, and then, to of this course, day, when you have that kind of hypersensitivity, you're looking for those connections and you'll force yeah. them. You'll shoehorn them into your yeah. life. Yeah, like, what you expect to see, if you look hard enough, you're going to find something that you can kind of, like, attribute to it, whether or not it has any logical attribution whatsoever. Um, I still catch myself sometimes, even, you know, all these years later, like, now being, you know, a parent, married in my 30s. Um, you're still young. Sometimes, like, <laughs> eh, um, that I sometimes will, like, say or do something, and I'll have this, like, moment of fear when I'm like, wait a minute, like reel it back. And, um, Hey, I I came through the public school system myself, so I understand how hard it is to deprogram. Yes. (laughs) And that's basically what you're trying to do. You're deprogramming. It it really is. It really is. Um, and one of the things I guess maybe from more like the mental health standpoint of it, it's been really hard for me to like accept some of these things like anxiety and depression. I'm like, yeah, okay. But then you think, I guess, a lot of the other, maybe not everybody, but for me anyway, it was kind of like these other things are something that, like, that's what someone else deals with. Like, looking at it, like, for me, I was like, no, you know, I didn't have a bad childhood. I wasn't starved. I was pretty happy. I mean, we went, you know, we did things as a family and a lot, you know. But then this, it was this one aspect, though, that had such, like, this anxiety-inducing, like, and fear-inducing like hold over me through those years. Um, that was a 24 seven, 365 fear yeah. that you literally could not escape no matter where you went in the world. It was there. Right. Right. Exactly. So hey, KZ, can you relate to any of this? Uh, very, very much. So there have definitely been points in my life where I'm like, did I do that that caused that? And it, 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 completely unrelated stuff, but it's still, you, 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 your mind starts thinking, and you know, as, as you get older, because it mostly was, you know, as a young kid, but as, as you get older, you're like, God, yeah, no, that definitely was not, you know, right. they, they did not go together. Yeah, exactly. At all. But at the time, I mean, you're young enough, you're, you know, like you were saying, your imagination gets rolling, and it's like, oh, no. But yeah, I, I totally. Yeah, as as you're saying it, I'm going. Yeah, no, I, I definitely uh, <laughs> experienced that a couple of times. I mean, it is there is something almost like comforting in knowing that like other people can relate um, instead of feeling like you're completely like alone in a situation. It's just, and that's kind of the goal of this whole <laughs> thing is that we're trying to get everyone to realize that you're not alone. You are your own unique person. Your experiences are uniquely yours, but your emotions, your feelings, th- there's only so many th- of those that any one person can have. Right. And there's so many of us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I guess, especially like looking at it as like a PTSD type thing, that was, it, it took me a long time, like several months to come to terms with the fact that like, not everybody that, has that diagnosis is going to have the same story or the same like situations that led to it like combat veterans and 
abusive relationship. People. Right, right. And that's what, and I didn't even want to even like say it because I'm thinking, you know, I haven't seen combat. I've not, it's not been like that. But at the same time, I'm like, but this is what I'm dealing with. And if I can't, I guess, accept it, how can I figure out how to work through it if I'm just in denial? Exactly. And some people may say that it's unfair to give it the diagnosis of PTSD. I'd, I'm sure you didn't arrive at that on your own. No. But, I mean, come on. When you're in combat, your life is under constant threat until you leave the, the combat zone and you're back home. When you're right. in an abusive relationship, you are under constant threat as long as your spouse is there. You didn't get a relief at all because the Sky Tyrant yeah. was there. Could yeah. look into your heart, look into your head, read your right. thoughts. Yes. As you call it, the Sky Tyrant. Now, I'm not trying to belittle God. For those of you Absolutely. out there that, that love God, by all means, don't let us change it. We're just saying this is the perspective that was given. Yeah, and that was just, like, for this aspect of my life. So, like, after um, – I've had – I'll just say I've had, like, tons of experiences in churches, like, after that, um, that were all the good things and the amazing you – know, the, the – not the asterisks, like, completely no asterisks. Like, it really is – you know, show up as you are, and here's a group of people that want to support you and help you, and all the, you know, all the good parts of it. Um, so definitely, in no way do I mean this to like make anybody think that I'm bashing that in any means, because that's not. This is like an example of one, you know, one bad apple basically at the time, not an overall of you know this is how everything is everywhere. Right, it would be like saying all Christians are like uh, members of the Westboro Baptist Church. That's just yeah, not those, the case. No, those those nut jobs are, yeah. Yeah, those nut jobs <laughs> decided to congregate their... together in their own little shell. Yeah, they're a breed of their own. That's yeah. yeah. Now we did have so, Klutz yeah. on to say about parts of what you were talking about is that she grew up in a Baptist and later Pentecostal church. Of course, you know I came through Catholic church, um, and then Brandy jumped in. Talking about, I think it's harder to admit you have something and acknowledge your feelings when you know someone else has had it worse, with quotes around worse. That's so, and honestly, that's so true, because that's what I said, like, it feels like it wasn't fair. Like, when you talk to somebody who's been a combat veteran or someone who's escaped, like, a very serious abusive relationship where they've actually been in fear for their life physically, um, it does kind of seem, I guess, like, you may be belittling what they've gone through to even to say like, well, here's what, here's my story. Um, but at the same time for all, you know, they, you know, combat veterans, people that, uh, abusive, you know, survivors may turn around and go, wow, at least I got breaks. So, you well, never yeah. know, they, that's, I've, that's one thing I've noticed is that a lot of people will tend to minimize their own issues and maximize everybody else's. And that's, de I mean, I'm definitely, definitely one that does that. Um, I'm and suspecting a little depression there for that. Hmm? I'm suspecting a little depression there. Because depression yeah. tends to be the one that causes that minimizing, maximizing. Yes. And I do, I mean, that is another um, generalized anxiety, depression. That's kind of probably going to add more as time goes on. My husband was actually joking with me the other day. He's like, I said something about a diagnosis. And he's like, what the doctor's saying? I'm like, I don't know. Give me another 15 years. I'll probably have five or six more things I can add to the list. Okay, hey, everybody, get your your uh, your uh, symptom bingo out. <laughs> We're going to go from <laughs> diagnosis this year. Yeah. Um, but one thing that Mai brought up here, and this is actually a good segue. Well, first I'll do Klutzana. Non-combat PTSD is a thing. Yes. The, the only thing, according to the DSM-5, when I read it, is that your life had to have been under some kind of threat. Now, for you, AJ, it was... Not only you, but everybody around you was under threat right. based on what you did. Right. And, and it wasn't that you thought that. It wasn't that you believed it. It's that you knew it. Yeah. And it was the, this is like fear. And even if I know there were times I say something about like being afraid of like this, this, or this happening. And I know like my mom, and my grandma saying like, why that's silly. I'm like, you don't understand. Like, okay. But of course I was, that was my little kid brain and you know, talking to a nine to 11 year old versus someone who's you know in their 30s and up i mean you, you definitely have a way different outlook on life and on things you know given those few decades of difference 
So. And then the one that Vi said, and this is perfect because I know you're going to hear it in your head when you, I read this to you. It's like you have a, you have free will, or blah. You have yourself free will without the guilt given to you by the church. Yes. Unearned guilt. Unearned guilt. Which I finally did get around to um, letting our mutual friend know what that uh, means to me. Just today, actually, finally was able to send him a message and be like, listen, I need to thank you for something. Um, Probably got the little smiley devil face. Uh. Yeah, I mean, pretty much. It was it was a heart, but Aww. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I let yeah. our mutual friend know that I was uh, before my account got suspended permanently. Oops, um, <laughs> that I'm finally going through a book that they recommended, and I got yes. the uh, the little devil smiley face. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually working on a book too, but I haven't had time to read it, and that was one that's completely like off topic of any of this. But yeah, if you want. <laughs> Got some killer recommendations on books about serial killers, just as a segue there. So. Oh. And then <laughs> Rachel Conway just jumped in. For PTSD, you can also witness something serious or have knowledge of major harm or death to a loved one. Something like that. And this is coming from an actual psychologist here. So, so that's, yeah. There you go. And Klatsana, one of the greatest lessons I learned was not to take on unearned guilt. Yes. That right there, that phrase, that phrase is actually, so I came across it and you know where it came from, but without yes. you know, going into games or whatever. Well, my book, um, it just came up with that for the first time when I was listening to it last night, so I do audiobooks. And I was uh, like, ooh, ooh, ooh! <laughs> <laughs> yes! Um, I came across that term on social media, probably close, well, I know it was close to two years ago, and that phrase, unearned guilt, kind of made like, it felt like a switch flipped and cause I'd never heard it before and never really even like thought that before. I knew that I had like this anxiety and like fear that still was kind of there and I hadn't really dealt with. Um, cause I hadn't really been able to talk about it. I hadn't really even been able to like admit it to myself because, and looking back at everything just seemed kind of like, Oh, well it wasn't that bad. And like, I mean, yeah, like a physically wasn't that bad, but like this anxiety and emotional part of it. Yeah. It was, I mean, I dealt with that. All the time, right? Um, well, I mean, unearned un- un- guilt for everybody that's ever been Christian knows it as yeah. original sin, right? Yeah. So if you've ever so, gone through anything Christian and you're kind of wondering what that yeah. was, there you go. You didn't do it; somebody yeah. else did. But they're throwing the guilt at you, right? So when I came across that term, yeah, and it was suddenly like this thing, and I was like, "Aha! That's that's it right there." Um, so I kind of started looking more into it, finally started like, I guess, asking the questions to like my, like my, uh, general practice, like my doctor, that kind of thing. Started talking about that to kind of get to where I am now, which, um, you know, probably still a long way to go, but improvement, you know, it's not, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. And as long as you keep moving, like you're making progress is, you know, that's something that I actually had a coach tell me once. So and it's kind of stuck with me. Um, so, you know, take it a day at a time. Some days are more anxiety ridden than others, but right. I feel like progress is good, even if it's slow. So one question I do have for you is... <laughs> what was like a really bad day? Like as you're in your teenage years, as you were struggling with all these thoughts and also starting to struggle with, you know, cause at that time it seems like it was really important to you that Mm -hmm. you were also starting to get glimpses of what reality was versus what your upbringing was. I mean, like what did that do to you to see that, Um, that what you were taught doesn't align with reality? Right. So my, The girl that became my best friend, like, all through high school and college, she also attended a local church, but it was, like, very casual, completely different. And so, like, getting to know her, and I kind of started, like, opening my eyes to things. I'm looking around, and I'm like, there's absolutely no way that anybody could tell me that, like, her family wasn't, you know, what you would call, like, good Christian people. 
like quote unquote. And I'm think so that kind of was like the the opening point that I'm like, you know, her dad's drinking a beer, and you know they they're going to get their groceries after church on Sunday, but there's no way that anybody could convince me though that like God hates these people basically, right? And so it was kind of this like inner turmoil to kind of like. I remember saying something to um, my family about like her church and how I was like, you know, they're taking the, they took like their youth group to go shopping after church on a Sunday. And that was like a big no, no for us. Like, no, like that's, that's church day. If you're like hardcore, follow the Bible by the letter. Yeah. Sunday's the Sabbath. You go to church and you contemplate and that's, that's it. Yeah. And so like, I was like, you know, maybe, maybe they're right. And it was kind of this thing. I'm just like, my parents just kind of looking at me like, okay, like, wh- where do we go from here? Cause I was like 16 at the time. I'm like, and I was like, how is it? And I started questioning like, like that, just the little things that kind of, I guess, segued into me being like, you know what, this super oppressive, like this, rule kind of thing that I'm feeling like that's not that's not right that's not like how it should be I'm guessing it was very terrifying for you to even have these thoughts too it definitely was at first I guess I got like used to them and accustomed like it it was kind of like you know stepping your feet in getting wet like slowly wading out into the deep end um definitely not like a dive it in head first kind of thing I grew Um, up in the mountains where some of those lakes yeah, you, you don't slowly ease in because you will <laughs> you'll go numb by the time you get all the way in. So you just dove in anyway, and, and you yeah. and you suffered. And I heard. I think I heard KZ laugh because he does exactly which ones I'm talking about. Uh, lower, lower Falls, man, McLeod. Ooh, man, yeah, that uh, Castle Lake. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> but yeah, and it was just. I don't know. I remember too, like the first, the first like boyfriend that I had, which I was in like freshman in high school. And I remember just getting like furious with him because he wanted to do something else. Like instead of going to a church event with me and I was like, yeah, but I have to go. And basically it was like, I had to go, had to, because there were air quotes there, by the way, folks. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Okay. We have, we have video here. You guys only have the audio. We do the video to help with little cues back and forth, but the video is not recorded and it will never be broadcast. Yeah. Which, you know, I'm looking pretty rough tonight, so it's probably good. Um, look, if I looked half as good as you did rough, I would be like happy. So I look rough. Sure um, you do. But um, so I remember like seriously, like getting, I mean, livid with him. Like if it were, the, you know, the day of, of like Tiger King, you know, wanting to like feed him to a tiger, pour sardine oil on him, throw him to the tigers. I was I so mad because, that. huh? On a segue, I really got to see that. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a train wreck. It's a trip, but you, you can't look away. Um, but I remember that. And I remember him being like almost baffled by the situation because he's like, okay, he's like, you have this thing that you've done and like gone to whatever. But he's like, this is something that I've done for a long time for years, too. Like, it was, like, two totally different, like, things. Like, it was something, like, I don't even remember. Some kind of, like, movie night or something that he always had with friends on, like, some random specific, like, weekend. That they always did, like, around the holidays or something. It was Looking back, it was so, like, innocuous and didn't matter. Um, not really, like, in the grand scheme of things. And, I mean, we broke up a few months later anyway. We were teenagers. Whatever. But, um... <laughs> At the time, it was, like, this huge deal to me, and I was just, like, almost this, like, crushing panic, like, I can't miss that. And, like, that's not a healthy way to live. No. Um, not at all. So, I that... mean, did it at least make you question why did you have to do it if others didn't and they weren't being yes. punished? Yes. Definitely. And, like, I... So there were a lot of, I guess, little things. I can't really think of, like, one specific, like, turning point where I was like, okay, this is all, you know, like, 
all of this is not how it should be. All of this is the way it should be. But there were just like little things almost that kind of like just chipped away at it enough until I was like, this can't be right. Um, example. So I remember um, overhearing some of the other moms in the church talking about how they were worried that their teenagers were listening to new worldly music. There's those air quotes again. And they were worried about them. And you're going to laugh. Um, they were listening to Billy Ray Cyrus. Wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> The achy, breaky heart dude. Yes. That's, they were at yeah, that that's was where I went. Song. That was the song. And, um, yeah, apparently, apparently achy, breaky heart is like what you jam to on the highway to hell. Like, you're, it, it, you're on the fast track. You're in the high occupancy vehicle lane just gunning it. Meanwhile, ACDC's pissed because they actually did a song, Highway to Hell. Right. <laughs> yeah, I don't, it, it's just, it's just these weird, like, little things, and so, I, know, I guess, like, talking about it helps, because for one thing, it's absurd, and I kind of jokingly say sometimes, like, I had just enough trauma to be funny. Um, you know, find the bright side, I guess. But also talking about it, though, it kind of... I hope that if there's other people that have gone through something similar, that if they understand that, like, they're not alone, that it will help. I kind of do want to find, like, a silver lining in the fact that, like, I had to deal with this and I'm still dealing with it. Um, it I don't know. Maybe that's just me reaching, like, hoping there's, like, some, like, deeper meaning or whatnot. But I feel like if I could help somebody, that would help, like, to me to know that it wasn't completely all for naught. Well, I mean, you've reached an audience already with this i mean right so and right now klutz Otta said girl you are beautiful deep in your soul beautiful with the heart <laughs> oh well thank you yeah and then there was talk about compassion is the human spirit but that's never talked about in the church unless you're talking about jesus's compassion of which apparently we're not worthy question mark yeah, that's okay. So and I said it actually, depends on the church because I've actually seen some where they do really yeah. do a lot of compassionate stuff and they teach compassion. Right. But there are those out there definitely. I mean, I would never, ever attribute the word compassion to the Baptist Westboro Baptist Church. Oh, never. No. No. no, there are like I know of some locally that, especially through this pandemic and the stuff going on right now, have been phenomenal. Like I saw an Instagram post. Um, I think last week, and it was where one of the local churches had given away, and it was something like 35,000 pounds worth of food to needy families in the past, like, month and a half. And I was like, okay, awesome. You know, that's great. Like, that's what it should, that's what people should be doing. Um, but yeah, so, like, going off that compassion thing, though, there's also this idea of, like, we kind of have to put ourselves on the back burner. And so, like, me you know, taking care of myself and that kind of thing. Like, this is like kind of a new, I mean, it was always like, you know, you do, you take care of yourself, you like going to the doctor, that kind of stuff. But it's actually like, but self care right. as like a priority and the um, supposed virtue of altruism, which, right. Which no. no. <laughs> um, and so I kind of had this like, okay, from, you know, my upbringing and knowing all this stuff, I kind of had this moment, um, I've been debating on like making a post about it and putting on my social media and such um, that in, you know, the command to love your neighbor as yourself is absolutely useless. If you do not love yourself. Exactly. That's beautiful. That that's a quote worth saving. <laughs> so I'm like, you know, that's that right. There's how it missed the mark, you know, for that. I think that can kind of like sum up, you know, that fear and that, oh, like, you know, I'm not going to be good enough. I'm going to screw up and this or that or that's going to happen. And at the same time, it's like, if I'm not, if I don't make me a priority, nothing else really matters because I'm not going to be able to do anything else. That was something that I had to learn on my own. I had no guidance at all. Um, that it just dawned on me one day. It's like, you know, if I don't take care of myself... How can I be expected to take care of anybody? Because I don't even know what that means. Right. 
Yeah, and it is, it's a different kind of idea from what we're kind of, just in society in a general, like, they talk about, like, oh, this person, you know, does all this, 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 and this for other people, and that's kind of, like, how people are typically hailed as, you know, their, you know, goodness or whatever. A pillar of the community, a stand-up citizen. exactly. Exactly, but on the other side of things is, like, you can't pour from an empty cup, so... If that if those person, like that person, if they're just completely destroying themselves to help somebody else, like eventually they're not going to be anything left of them, and the help's going to dry up anyway. And so, also, if you're giving uh, of yourself so much and not giving anything to yourself in return, well, that might be part of why we have a mental health crisis in America. Yeah, and I, I honestly think that I, I think like. So one of my first um, experiences with mental health was actually from um, there was a young lady that attended the church that I went to as a kid, and she was definitely dealing with depression and that kind of stuff. And I remember her family just being completely beside themselves and scared and worried and everything, as you know, a family would be. I was little; I didn't understand what was going on. I just knew that she, she was sick. Um, but like looking back. I kind of wonder if her being the age she was, she was a young adult, but she was like right on the cusp of adulthood, like 19 to 21 ish. Like, so just very young adult. Right. And so I wonder like, was she dealing with like the young, like the late teen adult version of what little kid me was dealing with at the time and just not knowing like, so and she seems to be doing great now in like the complete weird, you know, strange life's crazy turn of events. Um, I know her son pretty well now and her husband and they seem to be thriving and doing amazing. Um, but I just kind of wonder, too, if like a lot of her issue with like the anxiety and depression could have stemmed from some of the same stuff that mine did. Right now. I don't know if you follow us on Facebook. Um, I hope you do. And um, I always try to put little notes on stuff, you know, if there's any questions that go beyond time, which we're running short on right now. But if you right. wanted to make yourself known as to who you really are and uh-huh. maybe have someone reach out to you that may have gone through the same thing, you know, what you're looking for, by all means, you, you could do that on your time. You could even do okay. it on the show if you want to. As you know, anonymity is a big thing here mm-hmm. um, because, I mean, there's some people that have admitted some stuff that they would never admit in public and some things that they probably shouldn't admit, you know, and get themselves connected and maybe the long arm of the law might show up. But, <laughs> but, true. whatever risk you decide to take, of course, are yours. Now, okay. Brandy was saying about the uh, giving unto yourself things, like, reminds me of somewhere E and I used to work, giving so much of yourself that it decreases your own mental and physical health. I would go into that building, not into the building. I'd get in the parking lot and just dry heave in the parking lot before I went in. Ugh, I was so stressed. I, then by not quite that extreme, like, but I felt that with yeah. the job before, and it's oh, that's a terrible yeah. feeling. And then my, uh, I'm not a martyr for altruism, but when one suffers, we all suffer. But you always put your mask first in a falling airplane. True. Absolutely Very true. true. I mean, if you pass out and you're just in a free fall, I mean, you can't do anything for anybody anyway. Right. So. Yeah, it. I don't know. It's it's just kind of interesting for me too. I guess I feel like I've really came a long way from like where I used to be. I'm sure I still have a very long way to go. I know I do. Actually, I was. I'm convinced know, it's a lifelong I, path at this point. Yeah, I. I mean, it is. It's not. There's not going to be just a turn off moment where it's like, okay, that's all over. Um, but. I'm. Some days, you know, it doesn't feel like it, but it's okay. Like, you know, I'm dealing with it and it's yeah, honestly like, yeah, for the most part with the help of a good doctor and But unfortunately, the outro music is now playing. We have run out of time. Uh, ah. <laughs> so yeah, facebook.com slash am I, or sorry, mental live cast. If you want to continue the conversation there and go ahead, maybe create a sock account for the occasion. Yeah, 
So if we want to continue the discussion, we can do it there. But yeah, we literally have ten seconds left. Uh, Sorry. All right, well. All right, everybody, see, catch you later.